a few years ago when we had one of our first Vaishnava Christian dialogues in India. And on the second day, one of the Christian professors who was also a minister, he said something really profoundly that at the time I took as a, as a powerful endorsement of us. And hearing you two speak today in your summary, I'm just now realizing actually it's also insight on where we need to do better. And I'll tell you what that story was. It's simple enough. He was listening to this dialogue going on for like 24 hours or so. And then he said, I, I need to say something. And he said, I'm understanding. He said, we Christians, we really understand how God loves us. And he was thinking in terms of Jesus sacrificed himself. And, you know, the father came as his only begotten son and all of those things as part of their core theology. He said, but you Vaishnavas, you really understand how to love God appreciating our conversation about devotional service and how we should hear and we should chant. And this wasn't me speaking. This was this, this man. And I remember thinking, wow, we really have the most important part. I mean, I think I, I, in my own bias and prejudice, looking back now, it's been years, but filtering it through this conversation, I think I immediately kind of came proud. Like, yeah, we know how to love God. And yeah, we already know God loves us. But hearing the, this conversation, I'm realizing actually, we're not so good on that other part. You know, maybe, you know, we can learn from other people. Of course, it's definitely there in our tradition, as I even mentioned myself a few minutes ago. But it's, I think, I think, you know, sometimes the Christians are very strong and be able to walk around and say, you know, God loves me. They're very confident in that. And maybe some of them at least maybe minimize, okay, so what are you doing to reciprocate with that? Whereas with us, it, it tends to be a little bit like, I got to really work hard because I know it's all about devotional service. So I got to serve God. And, and as, as Ron Bruce said, in a sense, maybe I have to kind of earn that. And that's not our philosophy. It's, you know, there's, it's faith and, and works. We have to reciprocate. But I think that uh, this is very refreshing for me to hear that that really is, in a sense, 50% of the formula. He loves us. We love him. We love him. He loves us. We can't ignore either part of that or our spiritual growth really uh, is, is certainly is not complete at all. You know, just one experiment yeah. I did once after hearing this before, I can move to you. Just, you know, in a class once I asked, does Krishna love his devotees? So everybody said yes. Then I asked, does Krishna love you? And you know, everybody was like half raised, nobody was raising their hands. Mm -hmm. So somehow, it's like, yeah, Krishna loves his devotees, but then am I that devotee who Krishna loves? So in that sense, there's a significant difference. So this is just vindicating what yeah, you Yeah, we have shame. Sorry? Yeah, we have shame. And part of the, we are, we, we are ashamed of ourselves, perpetually ashamed. We can never repay Krishna. And so this, it's like this unreachable goal that we try to say thank you by our service. We can never reach it. And we can never realize our relationship with Krishna unless it, it, Krishna allows us in, you know, it, it, the grace. And we can't earn it, but through surrendering process and humility and honesty and and also serving the devotees, uh, we can please Krishna. We can't go directly to Krishna. We have to go through the Vaishnava Sangha. And therefore, I I believe, and this is where I enter the conversation as a, uh, chaplain educator is that um, we need to learn what bhakti looks like and feels like. So far, uh, people are great at describing it, and we do that all day in our classes. We're describing bhakti, but we don't know really what it means to love. You know, we we use that word a whole lot. What does love mean? What does it look like? Well, you know, you can you can um, draw from people who've studied it because we're not the only people who have thought about this thing. What does love look like? What are practical behaviors that would look like love or feel like love? And, you know, my, one of my favorite um, theologians slash psychologists is a guy named David Rico, and he, he boils it down to five behaviors. He said, love is not just a feeling. We throw that around a lot. It's it's an active thing, attention, giving attention, giving appreciation, aff affirming, affection, and allowing, which means allowing people to make their own choices, freedom. You know, even ba Krishna at the end of Bhagavad Gita, he gives you the freedom to choose him or not, to be in love with you or not. And so as Vaishnava, we're all part of Krishna's body, 
uh, in fact, part of why I'm doing this work is I had a dream in the 90s where Prabhupada said, I won't tell the whole story, but basically he's just, he's just asking me, can you ask your husband if you can take care of my personal body? And I woke up wondering what that meant and, of course, discovered he was talking about ISKCON as my personal body and gives the example of the, the sons who are massaging and brutalizing the father uh, because they're fighting. And so that has, has perpetuated me into a quest to realize that, you know, we're all Prabhupada's body as the Sangha of ISKCON. And so we need to be giving each other these five A's, if I may say, you know, attention, allowing, uh, appreciation, affirm affirmation, so if I can name them, uh, attention, like to focus, you listen when people are talking, to focus on each other, to off offer each other appreciation, affirmation, uh, uh, affection, affection and allowing, a uh, freedom to choose, you know, to, to give each other the freedom to be where you are in your devotional life and not be more than you are. Um, sadly, we tend to be embarrassed about our performance of bhakti, so we pretend that we're more than we are. That's sahajya. That's a sahajya tendency. And we tend to think everybody should be at the same level as I am. That's impersonalism. So as we know, when you, you pray the Prabhupada mantra, who came to the West to you know get rid the world of impersonalism and voidism, that was his main thing, is, is getting us free from this impersonalism and voidism and sahajism but we're all tainted by it as long as we're not pure devotees we all have to acknowledge i'm a sahajya and i am an impersonalist due to conditioning if we're not pure devotees and we have not uh, pulled out those weeds and we are not chanting without offense we have to know we have those two influences and we really need to be skeptical about our own attitudes and behavior and question that because these are not bhakti. You know, it's, it's really easy to fool, our, fool ourselves and to point fingers at other people without pointing them also back at ourselves. So, you know, I'm trying to create a platform where people can come and get out of isolation, because in isolation, you think you're the only one who has this struggle. In Sangha, we're here to support each other so we can make it. We can keep going long enough so we can become free from offenses. And that we, but you're not going to make it together if you're all the time criticizing and, you know, fault finding and gossiping about each other. We need to get in each other's corner and blow sugar on, a, on each other in the sense that uh, revealing the mind in confidence and hearing a person reveal the mind. And the problem is, uh, Chaitanya Charan, people don't know how. In this technological age, people don't know how to listen. They don't even know how, what they're listening for. They don't know how to hear. They don't know how to respond. It, it's, it's sad. We're so detached from our natural compassion that we don't know how. So it's really about learning some skills. <laughs> 